It's two months late and three days short, but it is here. The 75th edition of the Vuelta a España is about to start, and in the age of coronavirus, that's the headline news going into any major sporting event. Hello, the last time the Vuelta started on a Tuesday was 30 years ago, but you all knew that. Back in 1990, the race was run in the spring and had to be timed to finish in Madrid on the feast day of San Isidro. This year, it heads off into the mountains, dangerously close to skiing and flu season, in the hope of making it to Madrid at all. The reason for the Tuesday start 30 years on, of course, being not religion but contagion. The first three days of the Vuelta were supposed to be in the Netherlands, which was obviously unfeasible in the midst of a global pandemic. And the simplest way to save the race was a clean excision of the opening week rather than a hasty transplant. Likewise, a planned detour into Portugal has been abandoned, although for those reckless optimists looking as far ahead as Stage 6, a trip across the border into the French Pyrenees is still on the route. And in a spirit of optimism, let's take a look at the whole intended 18 days. Starting on what was originally Stage 4, which means opening in the Basque Country and the mountains. The first week of the Vuelta would have made an interesting second week of the Tour de France if that race had only turned south instead of north. And it finishes in France with what could be a snowy climb of the Col du Tourmalet. Week two starts back in the Basque Country, but this time heads west towards consecutive summit finishes on the Alto de la Farapona and the Vuelta's most feared and famous climb, the Angliru. The race re-emerges from the second rest day for its only time trial, another uphill finish on the Mirador de Athero. And the last summit comes on the final Saturday. The Alto de la Cobertia could decide who rides into Madrid in the red jersey, if other factors haven't already intervened by then. Should it succeed in running its course, this year's Vuelta will clock just under 2,900 kilometres, the bulk of which will be spent either climbing or descending. Summit finishes, as usual, outnumber sprinting opportunities, and with the traditional opening team time trial gone, there are just 33.7 individual kilometres against the clock. Uphill time trials are a topic of conversation probably best avoided around Primoz Roglic since the one that lost him the Tour de France last month. But the defending champion starts as the heavy favourite here and brings a Jumbo Visma team almost as strong as the one he had around him there. So strong that it includes perhaps his biggest rival, Tom de Moulin, who might now feel less inclined to sacrifice his own chances for the elusive promise of team success. Thibaut Pino's hopes of a tall win found up much earlier than Roglic's. If his troublesome back and shaky confidence were intact, he'd be a threat, although the prognosis isn't encouraging on either count. Spain's best hope is Enric Mas, back at his home race for the first time since finishing second in 2018, although Movistar also bring the 40-year-old Alejandro Valverde, as well as their perennial fixation on the team classification. 16 years younger than Valverde, almost to the day, is Alexander Vlasov, Forced out of the Giro through illness, he could be the latest of the new generation to challenge for a Grand Tour. Having pulled out of the Giro en masse after Simon Yates and four staff members tested positive for Covid, Mitchell and Scott held a team meeting to decide whether to ride the Vuelta at all. They're led by Esteban Chavez, who they're hoping rode himself back into form at the Tour. In fact, almost all the Vuelta contenders rode the Tour, including Richard Carapaz, who had been planning to defend his Giro title this year until Ineos had their big mid-season rethink. And that leads us to the one big name who wasn't in France and won't be in an Ineos jersey either once this strange shortened season is over. Chris Froome's brilliant career essentially began at the Vuelta in 2011, finishing second on the podium in Madrid ahead of Bradley Wiggins and behind Juan Jose Cobo in what he felt should have been his first Grand Tour win. As things turned out, it was, but his upgrade to first because of Kobo's doping only came to light after he racked up another five welters and two more runner-up placings trying to put things right, which he finally did in 2017. And that looked like concluding Chris Froome's business in Spain. Having finally scratched his welter itch, his big goal became winning a fifth Tour de France. It doubtless still is, but serious injury stopped him competing in last year's race and this year's once the team had evaluated his recovery decided not to offer him a place in the tour lineup or a contract for next season. Which means the Vuelta will bookend Chris Froome's Grand Tour career at Skinios before he moves to Israel's startup nation in 2021. Over two years since you've been in this position, i.e. on the eve of a Grand Tour, um, how does it feel to be back? It feels great. It feels, um, I've got that sort of nervous excitement of, uh, yeah, um, Great to have that feeling. I mean, um, almost like rewinding a few years and going back to sort of unknown of not really knowing where I'm going to be being on the start line of a Grand Tour. And yeah, 
quietly, quietly sort of optimistic, happy with uh, how preparations have gone so far and in training. I mean, good to see my sort of old numbers at least heading back in the right direction. You can take a lot from your, your data in training, and th that, that certainly helps, but you, you don't know where everyone else is at, and you don't know how you're going to cope with the race speed, especially when you haven't been racing a lot. But certainly from just a pure numbers point of view, I'm, I'm much happier now than, than I was, uh, say, before the Tour de France. Just in terms of sort of functionality, Chris, of the, the leg post-injury, is there any legacy whatsoever of, of the injuries, anything you feel on the bike or um, nothing of that sort? On the bike, I, I mean, I don't have any kind of pain or any lingering um, issues in, in that sense. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge for me recently has been just trying to regain that, uh, that, that, that top end power, especially on that side that was, that was injured. I mean, I have to remember that that leg was, was straight for sort of locked straight, not even able to bend it for, for the best part of six weeks. And I think, um, naturally, I mean, I, I think I'd lose a lot of my, uh, quad, um, through, through that injury. And um, a lot of my training recently has actually been in the gym, uh, been doing big focus on off-bike work recently, trying to trying to regain that muscle strength, and then um, obviously using training to try and transfer that onto onto the bike. What would constitute a good welter for Chris Froome, and what would be a good welter for Ineos Grenadiers? Ideally, uh, for Ineos, we, we win the welter uh, with Richard Carapaz. I, I think um, he's definitely got a, a good shot at it. For me personally, I'd love to be there in the mountains when, when it gets selective, but I've, I've really got no idea where, where I stand at the moment. So I think I'll find out pretty quickly in the first few days. And whatever the case is, I, I hope to build through the race. And as, as I get more racing in the legs, I, I'd like to come out of this Grand Tour, certainly not feeling as if I've got any any deficits going into next year. We're going to have seven British riders on the start line here in Irun in just a while. So we've got Froome, we've got Harry Tamfield of AG Tour La Mondiale. We've got three of Barre Merida, so that's Scott Davis, Stephen Williams and Fred Wright. Then there's also Hugh Carthy of EF Education First and Mark Donovan of Sunweb. But it's a pretty deserted Irun here in the Basque Country and that is because the anti-COVID measures here at the Vuelta, based on what we've seen so far, are even stricter than they were at the Tour de France, even more rigorous, partly because, unfortunately, cases in Spain, contagions continue to go up. On Thursday, in the Navarra region, they've got a lockdown starting. Now, we're due to go through Navarra tomorrow and Wednesday, so we should just sneak over the drawbridge before it goes up completely. I spoke to the race director, Javier Guillen, a couple of days ago. He's adamant, he's very confident the Welt is going to make it all the way to Madrid. And what a race it could be. We've got climbs today in the Basque Country. We've got wind, we've got rain, and we've also got a star-studded field. So Primo, it was a very intense Tour de France. Then you went to the Classics, you won Liège. Have you got the energy? Do you feel you've got the energy to contend for the victory here? Uh, well, yeah, we see, uh, but uh, I, feel, uh, I feel okay for the moment. Uh, I think it's normal before the start, but... Uh, uh, definitely, it's, uh, it's somehow a big challenge now uh, to do all this. Uh, I, it's also yeah, maybe something new for me. Uh, but uh, yeah, just uh, looking to, to quite a really yeah, successful season so far for all of us. Uh, I think we can really be uh, relaxed, confident and uh, just uh, have fun uh, because it's uh, just beautiful that at these times actually we can still uh, we can still have a race. I'm feeling pretty good, you know. We'll, uh, I'd love to love to ride the GC here, but yeah, we'll try and uh, see what happens this first week. I mean, this first week's gonna be decisive, and obviously, we do with the uncertainty surrounding the the situation, the COVID situation in Spain. Obviously, we don't even know how long we're gonna race for, but it's uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just take it day by day for that reason and try and uh, try and have some success early. Yeah, the first week is actually immediately the hardest one of the three. So that's unusual, like you said, and uh, after a week we know uh, how the GC will look like uh, also for the coming three weeks, I think, uh, more or less. Um, so who's going to be a contender and who's not, so we'll, we'll know more in a week.
Now, there's never much of a preamble to the climbing on the Vuelta, but this year's sawn-off start means there's none at all. Stage one runs 173 kilometers from the Basque town of Irun and takes in three third category climbs before the final sharp ascent to the sanctuary of Arate. The summit isn't the finish, there's a fast 2.5 kilometers to the line. Nonetheless, the last time it featured on the race in 2012, the top four here were the eventual top four in Madrid, so it's got form as an indicator of form. There's one of the enhanced anti-COVID measures in force at this year's Vuelta, a face recognition system that means the riders don't have to pick up a pen to sign in. And there's another, the daily ribbon cutting ceremony now suitably distanced, although I imagine the peloton couldn't be more indifferent to that if it was taking place in a neighboring country. Five men in the day's break when it settled down, Remy Cavagna of De Koenig Quickstep, Yasha Sutlin of Sunweb, Quentin Jaragui of AG2 Ala Mondial, Tim Wellems of Lotto Sudel and Yetsa Boll of Burgos BH. Behind them, Mobistar and Jumbo Visma were regulating the gap at the head of the main field. While right in the middle of it, Danny Martinez crossed wheels with somebody and came down. Quite possibly a teammate, given how many EF riders there were around him. Plenty of men to pace him back to the main field, you'd think. But it looked for a while as though he might not be able to continue, and by the time he did get going again, they'd all abandoned him. So Martinez had a difficult chase, with only his team car exhaust pipe for company, before a couple of teammates finally dropped back. Up ahead in the break, Quentin Jaragui led over the first climb of the day, aiming for the first mountains jersey of the Vuelta as insurance against the break being caught. And they're certainly not being given much leeway. As we join Ned Bolting and David Miller for commentary on the last 60 kilometres of the stage, their lead is hovering around 90 seconds. Ten kilometres of stage one of the 2020 Vuelta to go and the 2017 winner Chris Froome is finally letting go of the peloton on this treacherous descent as Team Ineos guides the remains of the peloton, all big favourites towards the foot of the final climb of the day in a couple of kilometres. The Alto de Arata, 7.7, its average gradient, long section of 10%, and Chris Froome, having battled to uh, stay in contention over the top of that penultimate climb, is looking backwards now on the road rather than forwards, and I think inevitably he is going to sustain quite serious time losses by the end of the day. But he hasn't declared himself here for the general classification. He has uh, suggested that he's here to support the team, Richard Carapaz, and then perhaps as he grows into the race, so he hopes, maybe take his own chances in the third week. So this is the Arata climb. That's where the race is heading. You can see the finish line there. The last couple of kilometres are downhill, mostly towards the finish. Uh, this sanctuary that overlooks the town of Aibar. Nestling in the Basque Hills, typical Basque countryside here, in typical Basque weather, it has to be said, between Bilbao and San Sebastián. Right, we're on the climb. Andre Amador setting the pace. Rivera on his wheel, the Colombian. Then comes Ivan Sosa and then Richard Carapaz. Jumbo Visma marking the team in the black and red. And uh, still a camera dedicated to Chris Froome. Who's uh, losing time and Damador setting a good pace here. Robert Hessink out of the saddle. Yeah, very strong, dominant and aggressive ride from Ineos Grenadiers to this point. And still, they, they've got a, a good number of riders there. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a controlled ride as well as, as Amador pulls off. But at the same time, it's, look how small that group is. It's, uh, that's not big for a stage one of a Grand Tour when we've not actually seen any aggressive racing from the big names yet, uh, yet we're down to that reduced group. And that's why I think I'd be cautious about critiquing Chris Froome. He's not far off that. And if he has come into this with how he's been talking, that's a good place for him to be starting. As we now see, was that Robert Hessing just peeling off from Jumbo Visma? So we're seeing those riders at the very front who are now peeling off as well. Jumbo Visma still with four once Hessink has gone. You can see two groups of two. Primoz Roglic in the round about seventh place on the wheel of Chavez, who in turn is uh, marking Dan Martin. And then the three Ineos riders remaining are Brandon Rivera, Ifan Souza, and uh, the winner of the Giro d'Italia last year, Richard Carapaz from Ecuador. Oh, it's exploding behind. The riders just pulling out of that. So we're going to have a very reduced group before long, before they've even started attacking at the front. You can see the, the gaps opening up and riders just pulling out. Look at that. Now we're just down to, what, 20, 25 riders? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's happening quickly now. Moby Star, uh, as we'd expect, as we often see them. Obviously, this is arguably their, their biggest race of the year, their home race, their grand tour. They all know the roads. This is, a, and also they're a team that is based not far from here in Navarra and Pamplona. 
but they are always uh, consistent when it comes to Vuelta Espana, and I think we can just see them. Let's see uh, if they do actually what their intentions are today. Looks like UAE team members have got at least one or two, Davide Formolo and Rui Costa, who I think is still there. Luis Leon Sanchez, actually, he's another Astana rider, the Spanish national champion. Not in the uh, light blue, but he's a teammate of Alexander Vlasov. Actually, that's Vlasov there. Just picking him out there, that looked to me like Alexander Vlasov from Astana has already been dropped, and that's not a great sign if uh, we get confirmation of that. Rivera can do no more. So then it's Ifan Sosa, the last man standing for Richard Carapaz. Yeah, uh, Ineos Grenadiers are riding a very, very aggressive race now. You could see that from Ribeira, he just gave everything he had. Formula looking ominous back there, UAE. And there is also Seb Kuz, Primoz Roglic. It's a little bit of a flashback to the Tour de France, how comfortable they're looking back there in about 10th position. And at the moment, they're just letting everybody else do the hard work. There is some damage being done here. Hugh Carthy's still there in the pink. The, uh, the light blue Astana rider, I think, must be Gorka Izegiri, as well as Luis Leon Sanchez. And Alexander Vlasov is dropped, and that is the first big surprise, I think because he's a huge talent and I think greater things were expected of him than uh, cracking on day one. Mattia Cataneo is the rider there, the Italian newly signed from Androni Giocattoli for the Koenig quick step. He's dropping away. And it's Clément Champoutin, the team leader notionally, the young rider, the Frenchman from uh, AG Toile La Mondiale, who's the next just to be put into difficulty. But Jumbo Visma still with four and their strongest four as well. Sepkus, Primoz Roglic, George Bennett and Tom Dumoulin. The same outfit you saw at the Tour de France. They're here at the Vuelta and they're riding right at the front of the race. Rui Costa now being dropped and uh, Danny Martinez, who crashed earlier and hurt his left foot by the looks of it, left ankle. His pedal stroke is a little bit uneven and it, he hurt himself in that crash. And that might be the explanation as to why the Colombian from EF Pro Cycling is uh, being dropped at this point. Wout Pools going out as well. So some real damage being done here by the young Colombian Ivan Sosa. Oh, look at Sosa. He can't have much longer left with a grimace like that on his face. And you can see he's starting to group up, so I think he's starting to slow down. So Carapaz checking. He can feel that his teammate's not got much left. He's got to decide what to do soon. And he'll look back and see there's still a lot of riders there. And probably the biggest thing that will fill him with fear is all those yellow jerseys. Because once again... He knows that they can choose to control the race whenever they like, so there's little point in him attacking yet. Halfway up the climb, 2.5 kilometres to go, probably too early. 5k from the finish, though, but two and a half kilometres of this climb still to go. Is it time to attack? Under five kilometres to go, 4.8 to the finish line. 2.3 kilometres of this climb still to go, and a monster effort from Ivan Sosa as the first of the attacks Ooh. has come, and it's come from Jumbo Visma. Looks like George Bennett is the first of the quartet of riders from Jumbo Visma to go. That immediately dispenses of Ivan Sosa, and Calapaz goes after him, taking Enric Mas on his wheel. Bennett, though, the first big... Sepp oh, Sepp Kuss. Forgive me, the first of the uh, Jumbo Visma riders to attack. Yeah, Sepp Kuss, it's hard to know whether this is... Uh, you would expect this to be an absolute setup to allow his teammates to then counter-attack. At the same time, you just don't know anymore because Sepkus is, d deserves leadership status in his own right. But look at the way he does. Then he soft pedals a bit, looks. He's got that kind of slide, sneaky glance behind just to see. Now he's definitely checking out. Now he'll shut it down because he sees that his teammate is not there. His leader, and his leader will still be Primoz Roglic. He's just waiting to see. And there he is, Primoz Roglic is now coming back up, just been following Dan Martin. Dan Martin coming there, just following. Now we're just down to leaders. Six at the front, Hugh Carthy included, Enric Mas, Dan Martin. Vede Formolo and Alejandro Valverde dropping away and off the pace. Perhaps no surprise, we haven't seen too much of Valverde this year. He's 40 years of age, don't forget. But Hugh Carthy now uh, hits the front, and Sepp Kuss goes with him, and Mass responds. So Carthy looking very, very good here from EF. Yeah, Carthy's been looking quietly good up that whole climb, uh, even for his... Uh, oh, Dumoulin. Tom Dumoulin not looking good. There's uh, Valverde's there. So Tom Dumoulin, he hasn't improved from Tour de France. He's actually... Looks like uh, any intentions he had of coming here and... And standing a chance of winning is going out the window as he shakes his head immediately at Valverde. It's as if to say, I'm not playing games here. I'm dead. Yeah, cycling parlance, not good sensations. Esteban Chavez is in that group of three riders with George Bennett. And uh, I think it must be Felix Grosschartner from Borda Hansgrohe who are just stranded the wrong side of that little gap. As now Dan Martin goes on the offensive. And Enric Mas once more is 
one of the most uh, willing riders to respond. That's about the third time that Mass has shut down an attack. Now, knowing Dan Martin, because when Dan Martin goes, he's got about a, from we've always seen from him, about a one kilometre huge effort he does. So that was more of a test attack to see who's strong, who's not, how he's feeling. And when he goes, Dan Martin, normally it's, a, it's decisive. If Sepkus now goes again, Karapaz reacting immediately, he knows the threat. Roglic can't let Sepkus go. Roglic going with Enric Mas. Uh, and then uh, little groups further down the road. That's the Dumoulin group with Davide Formolo, Alejandro Valverde. This group, I think, is out of focus and uh, going out of sight at the moment. Yeah, they, they are certainly not. You can see the body language, the, the grimaces in the faces, just the way they look. Now, here we are at the front group again, whereas in the meantime here, it's attack, it's slow down. Everyone's looking around, everyone's checking. This is a tactical race at the front. This is not full capacity. Carapaz weaving all, all over the front, road, almost. Take. Carapaz yeah. just, I don't know whether he's blown by the wind or just enjoying himself there, but toying with the opposition by the looks of it. Dan Martin just biding his time. Now, Dan Martin, as I said, he is a very, very tactically astute bike racer, and he's just going to be monitoring things. Now, it's whether he makes a decision to try and break free or whether he's confident to win the sprint from that group. And it all settles down again. In the meantime, Gros Schartner and Chavez, and uh, who's the other rider? There were three in that group of joined up so three more riders have been added into the mix here George Bennett it was so Jumbo Visma with three riders here yeah and George Bennett just hanging on with Sepp Kuss once again as we're just so we're growing so accustomed to just seeing him being such a dominant player dominant player when it comes to these final groups and this these decisive moments in the bike race Sepp Kuss is there and you can't imagine these days Primoz Roglic racing without him because he does seem to set everything up for him we're yet to see whether Primoz Roglic is at his best. To be surprised if he's not uh, uh, be able to dominate this. It's just we're so used to his consistency. George Bennett, they're not able to contribute yet. Hugh Carthy just looking at him, checking him out. Chavez is just kind of seems like a bit of a an also ran at the moment in this group. Dan Martin, Carapaz also looking strong. I think Dan Martin is is strong enough to actually dictate a little bit of tactics in the moment, and he's trying to decide what to do. I don't think he's going to try and break away. I think he's going to try and go for a sprint. Every one of these little switches in direction as the road snakes up towards the top, David, affects the race in different ways because it's a strong wind predominantly over their right shoulders, but a little change in direction could turn that into a headwind, and I think that's exactly what they've got right now as Kuss hits the front. Yeah, and this is where it becomes a little bit, as we, we, we're now used to seeing, everyone looks at Jumbo Visma to dictate the tactics, and especially when Sepp Kuss is there, they know Sepp Kuss can control a group like this, and so that does also deter, it stops it, people being aggressive because they see what, think, what's the point? It's one of the Jumbo Visma riders who just chased me down. So now it's up to Jumbo Visma to control this and set it up in the hope that Primoz Roglic has got the sprint that we've seen, that we saw him, he won the Liege Baston Liege only a few weeks ago in a sprint against some of the best in the world. So they do have that confidence there. And because Sepp Kuss is not a sprinter and George Bennett now is dropped, so it's just down to Sepp Kuss and uh, Primoz Roglic in that front group and Sepp Kuz now his only job is to deliver Primoz Roglic to that finish line and that is it that's the selection Gors Schartner the man from Border Hansgrohe Chavez looking good but uh, Bennett and Gors Schartner and Chavez were the three riders who had just dropped off last time they started to attack so uh, perhaps one of the uh, more vulnerable group of riders to the next attack should it come yeah and let's not forget as well we we know that Sepkus Primoz Roglic, the Jumbo Visma as a whole, they're here to the GC. So it's, it's easy to forget after a day like this that it looks like a one-day race and how they're racing. Also, it's in Jumbo Visma's interest now. They've got a small group to try and just uh, make the gap bigger. It's, Tom, it's George Bennett in the distance just hanging on there slightly. But at the moment, Primoz Roglic is a contender here for the GC and overall. So Sepkus isn't just racing to line them up for the stage win. It's to reduce the GC contenders. Eight riders in contention to take the victory and with it the jersey on stage one of the Vuelta. Roglic means business at this Vuelta. This isn't just a, an, a, a, an additional optional bolt-on to a disappointing season ultimately for him, if you can call second place in the Tour de France disappointing. I think definitely the team and Roglic personally want to make good and end 2020 on a high and capitalise on all the good work that they've done as they go over the top of the climb with 2.5 kilometers remaining it was Sepkus who took the maximum 10 points so whatever happens Sepkus will be the king of the mountains uh, going into tomorrow 
but far, far bigger concern now is the possibility of Jumbo Visma, his teammate Primoz Roglic, taking the victory and taking the jersey. It's pretty flat now. Sepkus riding on the front, Enric Mas on his wheel, Richard Carapaz, Dan Martin, then comes Esteban Chavez, Felix Gorschartner, Primoz Roglic and Hugh Carthy. That's the final selection. And we're going to be entertained by the sight of these non-sprinters sprinting again from really quite a big group. Oh, yeah, Hugh Carthy has to go. He's not got a sprint on him. He has to try and go early because he doesn't stand a chance against a group like this when it comes to the actual sprint. But everyone knows that. They'll expect him to go, and Sepkus is there. Now he can leave to Enrique Mass, who's now going to try and close him down. Carapaz there in second position. But this is the right thing for him to do, Hugh Carthy. It's the only chance he has. Opens up a very small advantage, which Enrique Mass is closing. Bit by bit, one kilometre to go, coming up to the kite. And uh, the road flattens out a bit, most of the descending is done, still battling this strong wind. Sepp Kuss now distance, which goes to show you can never tell how hard he's going. Primoz Roglic doing counter-attack. So Roglic going, sensing his moment just as it stalls after Hugh Carthy was caught. Carapaz straight onto his wheel, Enric Mas now. But that's a big move from Roglic and the kind of move we've seen before from him. Roglic might be about to deliver the first and telling blow in the Vuelta. Carthy is put to the sword and he's out the back. The man who attacked the group first, but Roglic has gone. Bit more descending to go in the final kilometre. Can he be caught on the line? Did he go too early? Still got 500 metres to go, pretty much Roglic. There he is, Dan Martins after him, Carapaz. They are closing. Esteban Chavez has got a fast finish on him. Just a couple of seconds to make up. Roglic, has he got enough time there? 200 metres to go. Surely he's going to coast to victory and take the first stage and take the red jersey, which he won last year. Primoz Roglic is going to pick up where he left off at the Vuelta. Job done, Primoz Roglic. A brilliant and trademark victory from the man from Slovenia with number one on his back. That was a statement of intent. And once again, Sepkus played his part. But there we go. Any doubts about Primoz Roglic's form and his mental state after the disappointments of Paris? Well, put him to bed, because he is here to win this bike race. And here is Primoz Roglic. Any doubts of his status as a champion? Well, forget about it. What he did today just goes to show that he is one of the greats of the current generation. Yes, although generations are changing fast, as this season has already shown. A clear second on the line between Roglic and the rest, with Carapaz and Martin taking the bonuses for second and third. Hugh Carthy was three seconds adrift of Chavez, Groschartner and Mass, having tried to jump them. Cus and Bennett in eighth and ninth underlined the strength of Jumbo Visma. Although Tom de Moulin would have hoped to be stronger, and behind him the gaps for a Grand Tour opening stage were large. Alexander Vlasov and Danny Martinez lost nearly five minutes. Vlasov without having crashed as far as we know. Thibaut Pino confirmed that he's in the category of recovering riders along with Chris Froome. And Michael Woods was EF's second and worse off crash victim, certainly in terms of time. Their three-pronged attack is down to a single prong. Uh, it was OK. We're pretty, uh, pretty nice ride. I know I've done it quite a few times over the years, so no surprises. Uh, no, it was hard, but felt good, felt in control, so happy with more I saw it went. And obviously there was bad news earlier in the stage with Danny's crash. I mean, did you get the instruction straight away that you could just look after yourself? Uh, well, I was kind of in that position to start off with, sort of, uh, there's no real responsibility for me to look after him, so, uh, yeah, I just carried on as normal. Uh, um, but, yeah, I think he's cut his hip and, well, I think, I don't know. I've not spoken to him, so I don't know how he is. The way the team rode, um, obviously Sepp went to the front and he was attacking. I mean, what was sort of decided over the radio on that final climb? Yeah, the, the, we would approach the race more open than in the Tour. In the Tour, uh, we, we dominated the race with uh, pulling on the front the whole day. And now we want to attack a little bit in the final and that worked out. And yeah, eventually Primo took the stage, so that's good for us. And so began the Jumbo Visma podium show. Roglic rolled out the ski jump landing celebration for his stage win, then returned to take the green jersey of points leader, having picked up 25 on the line, before giving way to Sepp Kuss, who took the mountains jersey as a byproduct of his work for Roglic on the final climb. Henrik Mass finally broke the Jumbo monopoly by taking the white jersey that he won overall two years ago. Mass is the third of three riders at 11 seconds behind Roglic. Martin and Carapaz are the only ones within a stage win bonus of taking the race lead. And on that subject, when the race favourite takes the lead on day one, talk inevitably turns to whether he intends to stay there for the whole race or try to lose it to someone strategically acceptable. 
Oh yeah, let's start with the uh, with the first one uh, tomorrow. Uh, and like I said, I don't want. Uh, it's quite a strange season. Uh, I, I had a lot of uh, of, uh, of races and stress and everything. And yeah, I, I just want to enjoy it here. Uh, to to that it's super nice that we can still in these times uh, do some races. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully just fun to watch uh, at home. Admirable sentiments and understandable given his experience in France last month. Just in case he's wondering though, the last man to wear the Vuelta leader's jersey from start to finish was Tony Romming at 26 years ago.